The following interview was conducted with Dan E. Shandell, the Blake Family Endowed Chair of Strategic Management for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, July 16, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good morning, Professor Shandell. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Mm. Well, I was born in uh, Wisconsin, western Wisconsin, the so-called uh, driftless area that was unglaciated. Remind you, when you go down to Brown County in Indiana, you're reminded of the, of the kind of uh, terrain I grew up in. But it was right on the edge of that uh, driftless area. You go 15 miles north or northeast, you'd be in sandy country, and then you'd head out into the lakes and so on. So uh, I was used to uh, hills and dales and I grew up there in a small town called Norwalk, Wisconsin. It had uh, 553 people that I remember on the sign. Uh, it was a, uh, a community that served farmers, dairy farmers. And my father had come off, uh, his name was Leonard. Uh, he was uh, the third of nine children on the farm and uh, had broken away from uh, his family uh, early on and started working in, uh, in uh, sawmill. And he had an eighth grade education, that's where his education stopped. And he, he made his, his living throughout his life as an entrepreneur uh, that variously went into threshing grain uh, on contract for farmers in those days. Uh, gave up the sawmill in the Depression, uh, got involved with, uh, I suppose, what was a stimulus package of uh, grinding limestone that was used to resuscitate land. And uh, then came World War II, and nearby, uh, near a town called Sparta, which is 13 miles north of us, uh, not in the Driftless area so much, uh, where they built a uh, army camp that's now Fort McCoy that does a lot of summer summer training. Mm -hmm. It's midway between another town called uh, between Sparta and another town called Toma, and uh, Toma is famous for the intersection of 94 and 90 split there, one to go to Minneapolis, one to go west, <laughs> and, and uh, that was about 15 miles away from. And so my father was a, was a self-employed, entrepreneurial, and I, I thought he was an intelligent man, um, fiercely independent, uh, but he made his way and, uh, and had done well for he and his family. Was able to support them and things were okay. Yeah, the, right. the life was a good one. He, he worked right. very hard all his life. Sure. He wanted me to go in the business. I, could not see that, uh, and I felt I needed to leave, and I had done well in school, and uh, had in mind going to college. No one in my family had ever gone to college. My mother had uh, was born in Norwalk, grew up there, lived all her life there. Uh, she had a high school education, and uh, was a typical housewife of those days. Sure. Do you have any brothers or sisters? I have, uh, I have two brothers and a sister. I'm the oldest. Uh, my youngest, uh, the youngest of the family, is 17 years younger than I am. And I, uh, if he gets out of line, I tend to chide him about how I've changed his diaper, which I have when he was young. Sure. And uh, and a sister who trailed me by three years, and another brother uh, who did stay with the businesses. Uh, nine years younger than I am. Still lives in Sparta and moved out of Norwalk to Sparta. Big, big move. Anyway, uh, Sparta was a county seat of a county called Monroe County. And uh, that's where I grew up. And I went to a Norwalk school system, which by any standard today would be considered, uh, a student in it would be considered disadvantaged. For example, in my high school, uh, to qualify for the University of Wisconsin, where I have a baccalaureate degree, 
I had to take uh, plane geometry by correspondence, which is an interesting <laughs> subject to teach yourself. <laughs> I would think so. By correspondence, I don't think I can handle that. But I can remember getting, sending off the mail and getting it back. Uh, I was a geometry teacher in a Madison High School that did the grading. And, uh, red ink all over the place, and, but it was very helpful. I passed. That's an yeah. interesting term that you don't hear in correspondence, and I'm sure some people say, course by correspondence? I mean, handwritten, not, not online. Yeah, the mail, well, there, there was no library in my town, and, and uh, uh, the state of Wisconsin ran a uh, mail system for books. And I can remember as a boy reading Paul Bunyan books and getting them and getting a whole stack of them sure. and then sending them back. And uh, uh, so... Uh, so I, w I would have been I would have been called a disadvantaged student by any standard, but uh, uh, but was the I, high school very large? Were no, I, I graduated from a class of seventeen people. Uh, I don't say that when I say I was the valedictorian of the class, <laughs> but but I was, okay. and uh, 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 but grade school, for example, was always a uh, two grade per room. But a school had four rooms on the ground floor, and I sat for grades one and two, three and four, five, six, seven, eight. And I remember being a seventh grader and the teacher at the time, who also taught me at eighth grade. It's true, of every grade I had, I had the same teacher for two years. Um, so I had only four teachers by the time I got to high school. But she uh, gave me the examinations that she gave the eighth graders. I passed them all. And she said, I don't know what we're going to do next year. <laughs> we'll have to think of something, right? Well, well you know, you, when, when she was teaching the eighth grade, the seventh grade was sitting there, sure. presumably oh, sure. studying. Right. Well, I was mostly listening. And uh, I look back on that, it's kind of amusing to think about. But that was my school, and then a four years of high school. And uh, for me, high school was uh, easy. I, uh, I was a good athlete, and I became part of a small school. I became a varsity basketball player, starter, as a freshman, and, and uh, was kind of into, you know, not paying a lot of attention to grades because it was very easy. And I got suspended for a game <laughs> for not being, I'm sure, a terrible smart aleck to, to a young teacher. Got sent to the principal's office. He suspended me. Was, my father was livid about that. Just livid. And I got to thinking after I said, I really like to play. And, and if that's, it means I better treat people with respect. That's what I'm going to do. So I can play. And so I, I, there was kind of an epiphany for me. And, and uh, and uh, while well, there was always a, a very serious colleague, a, a classmate, who did better than I did, all of a sudden it was just like switching roles, and he right. became the salutatorian of the class. I became the, the model student, and uh, became a varsity basketball. I played four years, and, and uh, uh, it was uh, I was pretty good. I I carried that over to try out just as a walk on at the University of Wisconsin. As a freshman, of course, freshmen couldn't play in those days. Sure. I'm speaking in 1952. Uh, made it to the last cut, but didn't make it. I, uh, that was an interesting, disappointing experience for me. But I did play baseball at the University of Wisconsin, so made that team. But uh, for a small time boy to come out of Norwalk uh, and to go to college was a very, very unusual thing. How did you happen to select the University of Wisconsin? Well, like many people in their state, it's the cheapest place to go. Uh, I had an uncle who had a fifth grade education. He was a very, very skilled machinist. In fact, had worked for uh, uh, a Gishol Machine Tool Company in Madison. And he self-taught. Uh, I later learned that he knows something of calculus. <laughs> And um, 
he was adamant that I go to school. He was a bachelor. You know, he never married. And he thought I should go to school. And he said, if, if your father won't pay for it, I will. Well, my father was in a business called Schendel Brothers. The brother was my uh, uh, uncle, who was the oldest of the nine children I mentioned. Right. He respected school. And uh, he was always encouraging to me, uh, even though my father thought I ought to be in the business. And, uh, but my father taught me something it took me years to appreciate. When we were talking about being in the business, he said to me, uh, you'd like me to do that. And I said, Dad, uh, your business is, you, you work, uh, he, he gravitated into road construction. From grinding limestone was a natural leap. I, uh, I was mentioning right. Fort McCoy. Right. Well, then you had the need for graveling or putting gravel on roads. And so they came to him and asked him to crush gravel, uh, not down to powder size limestone, but so he did that, and that became a business for him. And that was the business that uh, sure. he kept going with it. And it, it gravitated to supplying uh, crushed gravel for road constructions right, and right. so on. And I, I, for example, in summer in college, drove a gravel truck <laughs> and uh, worked 10 hour days. And, and made enough money really to pay for my school. I was I went in ROTC when it was in, uh, Was that mandatory? Uh, yeah. At, right. yeah, it was yeah. mandatory for two years, but right. not... Like it was initially. It yeah, was right. In the right. second two years, I decided to stay in the Air Force, and uh, that that gave me a kind of a different perspective. I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. But, um, but I, I also got scholarships. Uh, and uh, I would say my college education cost my parents maybe fifteen hundred dollars, maybe across four years. The rest of it I supplied with scholarships and my own earnings. And uh, did you live on campus? No, uh, I. Uh, well, I, I, in a sense, I did. I I was unaware of things like fraternities. Did you stop? Did you go down before school started yeah, and get a went with bit? my mother? Okay. And and we ran across a very nice. We were looking for just a room. Sure. And I can remember the room cost a dollar a day, seven dollars a week. And uh, we ran across this very nice lady. She had a invalid husband who had a kind of a I don't know brownstone type thing and and had plenty of room, and I, so I got a room there, and the two other fellows had rooms there, were very nice, very helpful, they were upper class. And so I took a room there, and worked out of that room, and, and uh, I remember, you know, they always tell these stories about deans saying, look at either side of you, and, you know. well, I, I, I listened to that lecture, and I, I, was, I was... And it's true. It's true. It was. It turned out to be true, and I was terrified by that because I, I didn't, I didn't have. I, I was looking at people, and I remember having an I went in engineering, and I had a mentor, who had been through there at Madison, uh, lived in my town, and he, he gave me a book, in my, uh, senior year of high school. He said, "This is a math book." He said, I know what kind of math you've had, it isn't enough. He said, I want you to study this math book. He said, if you study that, you're going to get to have to take a qualified math exam. He said, 75 is passing. If you get 75, don't let them talk you into taking remedial math. He said, you go into the math course for credit. I did that. <laughs> I got 76. <laughs> And I did exactly what Don told me to do. I go into this math course, and here's the guys from Beloit, Milwaukee, and all these places. Oh, God, we had all this stuff, and I'm working like a dog to catch up. It didn't take but six weeks before I became a consultant to those students because <laughs> they, they, they got sloppy. They thought, oh, I knew all this stuff. I had all this stuff. They thought they knew it, but they didn't. They thought they already had it. They, yeah, and, but they hadn't learned it. And, and it was, of course, the best advice I'd gotten because uh, I didn't take remedial math, and I, and I did very well. 
Well, that first year was uh, after six weeks of being terrified and then finally getting a feeling of it. I worked very hard. I mean, it, it sure. wasn't that I was a genius or anything. Uh, but I gained co a lot of confidence. And success does that for you. It builds your confidence. And, and um, so the, 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 the lost time in, in my schooling up to that time I was beginning to catch up with. And I took a, a degree in metallurgical engineering. Why metallurgical engineering? Because that's what my friend was in. And so I was in ROTC in metallurgical engineering. And uh, I remember when I graduated, uh, and I stayed in, room, in a private room all my days there, four years. 144 credit hours, four years. And uh, Yeah, enough checkers. On, this, on the board. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I, 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 I never joined a fraternity or a dorm. Uh, I learned a lot about them. And I, I met my wife, who's a sorority person. I learned a lot about sororities. <laughs> I didn't meet her till I was a junior. And uh, uh, she was majoring in education. was from Indiana, which is why, in part, I'm here. But uh, uh, but I, I remember working out of this this in the, the rooming house I was in is now gone. It's a dormitory of all things at the foot of a long, about one mile from uh, from the buildings I had to frequent in engineering. So I remember walking in the winter times. And it seemed like the winters were a lot colder in those days. Uh, maybe they weren't. I don't know. <laughs> but. Uh, <coughs> I did that and uh, and graduated on time and in ROTC and I, I did very well in college. I uh, I think I, my grade point was on out of basis of four three ninety six. But I want to tell you a score a story about a course I had to take mechanics and it was taught uh, by a professor who I, uh, my advisor told me uh, regarded himself as the keeper of the standards of the engineering school. <laughs> you know the type. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I took this course as a junior, first semester junior. At the end of six weeks, I had an F. Well, it turned out all my colleagues did too. And I went to the advisor and said, Dr. Rosenthal, what am I going to do? And he said, well, he said, relax. He said, this guy does this all the time. And I said, he said, well, go talk to him. So I went to talk. And he said to me, and I'll never forget this because it's got a, there's more to this story. He said, well, Chambil, you just look like a C student to me. And I said, well, at least that's passing. <laughs> and he laughed, and I left. And uh, I worked hard. I really did in that course. I thought, I'm going to prove I'm better than that. I thought I really did well in the final. And indeed, I got a C. However, that same semester, I was elected to Tau Beta Pi as so a first semester the honor, junior, the honor, which was the really engineering good. honor. Yeah. Who should be the advisor to it but Professor? And now I'm going to tell you what his name is. His name was spelled F L U C K pronounced fluke. He, he couldn't win no matter where he was. Anyway, came the ceremony for induction, and I knew he was the advisor, and I knew he was going to hand out the, the certificates. And I thought, when he thanks me, I'm going to have to have something to say. And here's what I decided to say. We're shaking hands. I said, not bad for a C student, is it, Professor Fluke? And he laughed. He really thought that was funny. <laughs> it was the only C I ever got in college. <laughs> and, and, uh, but you passed. But again, that was confidence right. building, and yeah, but I had it, and uh, so I, I uh, while I early on played athletics, I decided I had to quit if I was going to get through in four years because I didn't have a lot of money, and I wanted to do that. And then there was the Air Force, so uh, from there I got a direct duty assignment to Wright Patterson Air Force Base, right into a research lab, the materials laboratory. 
again, partly because of my friend who was stationed there. He got me through this. So I never went through basic training or anything uh, except for a summer uh, where you had to do that for six weeks, and which was a very eventful summer. But, but uh, that was my jump out of college. I remember interviewing for a job, though, because I could take a job before I went in the Air Force. And I ended up uh, at Alcoa uh, Company, where I worked as a plant engineer for a time before I went into the Air Force. So I've had a little industry career and a little taste of that. And then uh, at the Air Force, uh, in the Air Force at Bright Patterson, three year duty, I, uh, my assignment was really. Uh, helping write requests for proposals, evaluating proposals, granting contracts. Uh, we didn't do the contract writing, another unit did that, but the technical part of it. And so we were monitoring research all the time. Sure. And, uh, but it taught me a lot of things. But also while I was there, I had the opportunity to participate in a program that was offered by Ohio State under contract to the University or to the Air Force to get an MBA, which I did you know, during that three year period. And I did very well at that and enjoyed it. And my intent had always been if we go back, if I can step back a little bit, my career plan was to be uh, to work in professional management, not engineering all my life. But I worked with a technical company gravitate because I, I like the idea of what my father, I, I didn't finish my story about the father, I'll go back to that, but my father was the boss. And I remember, if I can go back to that for a minute, he, in trying to talk me into coming and staying with the business, uh, we got to talking about it. and I said, Dad, you work hard in the summer, you don't, you, you work on the machinery all winter, you get it ready for the next summer. And I said, see to me, you work for machinery. He said, you never take a vacation. And we didn't. As a man. He said, what do you mean? He said, I, I can take a vacation anytime I want to. And I laughed and I said, but you never do. He said, that's not the point. The point is, I could. And I said, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. You know how the youth can be. I never got the point of that story till later in life when I got to thinking about uh, a lot about my dad and how independent he was. Uh, he didn't suffer fools very gladly. And I turned out I don't either. <laughs> and he, uh, as I thought more and more about it, I thought, you know, he really has a point. That the thing you need to value in life is independence. The independence to do with your life, what you want to do with it. It makes you comfortable, makes you happy. And uh, I'm sure that's one of the things that drove me into academia, uh, where I think you can, you can act like an independently wealthy man without having wealth uh, if you become a, a successful uh, academic. In any event, I, uh, my goal then was to be a professional manager or uh, possibly a management consultant. And when the time came uh, uh, to think about what to do, I interviewed with some companies and uh, had some job offers, including going back to Alcoa. But in the meantime, the Ford Foundation had taken quite an interest in business education. And they had invested some money what became known as the Ford Foundation Report on Business Schools, published in 1959. I got out of the Air Force in 1959, in December, and worked as a civil servant until the following uh, August when I went to Stanford University. Now, uh, how did that happen? Well, I was looking for a job and in 1959. And I had the opportunities, but my advisor at Ohio State said, you know, Ford Foundation has 
written this report, and they want to put some money into improving the scholarship that is involved in business schools. And so they're funding doctoral programs. And the way they were funding it was to award it to individuals who could take the scholarship to wherever they were admitted as, at their choice. Well, I had been admitted to Harvard and Northwestern and uh, Indiana and uh, Stanford. Uh, maybe there was another uh, that I'd applied to. But I was attractive because I brought all this money with me. <laughs> and it was quite generous. Quite for the whole doctoral program? For the whole doctoral program. Including uh, living expenses, too? living expenses, tuition, and the school, whatever was given to me was matched for the school. So I was very attractive. And, oh, I, yes. I, and I had that in 19, I was awarded that in 1959 and uh, elected to go to Stanford. Now part of that uh, ties into a professor of some fame who was long here at Purdue. When I was doing this MBA, I had a mentor who taught me uh, in a course in marketing. His name was Frank Bass. Frank was a fairly famous name in marketing. And he urged me to pay attention to what was happening in the field of marketing, uh, which was it, was, it was taking on a bent that was starting to use computers which were just becoming feasible in the 60s as resource and research tools and a mathematical bent to model building. Uh, so I paid a lot of attention to that and I elected then to go to Stanford, which was a good choice for the purpose. And I Were you was, married at that time? I was, uh, I was married in, in 1956, right out of college, oh, okay. to, my, to my wife. We've been married <coughs> since 54 years. And uh, as I say, she was in Indiana from Lake County. Her father was an attorney there. And, uh, and that's part of the story as to why I'm at Purdue. But we went out to Stanford uh, and, and all the time where we could have had children free of charge, but via the Air Force, she became pregnant. <laughs> and we went to Stanford and she was pregnant at the time. Uh, she had been teaching as an elementary school teacher in Dayton, Ohio, for five years, or the period I was there. And we managed to save up a little money, and, and anyway, we had no children. And we go to Stanford, and she found a job easily at a very fine school district there, at, around Palo Alto. And uh, we went to Palo Alto, and so we're looking for a place to live, and we, we happened to select a motel right across from which was a real estate agent. So we walk into that real estate agent and say, we were looking for an apartment, could you help us? Well, uh, got to know the office a little bit as we were looked around and they were helping us, showing us what was available. And one day the broker, the owner of it, called me in and he said, uh, he said, why don't you buy a house? I said, Mr. Allhouse, I'm a graduate student. I, I could flunk out tomorrow. And, he's, and he said, look, you've saved money in the Air Force. You've got some of your wife is pregnant. You're going to need to move. And he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you buy a house through me, he said, I will guarantee you the equity return to you. We'll write it up and so on for the first two years. He said, you'll surely make it if if you don't make it, if you don't make it then, then it's your fault, not mine. And uh, I said, well, why would you do that? He said, two reasons. And one, he said, I'm an associate baseball coach at Stanford, and you've been a baseball player, and we, uh, I know that. And he said, second, he said, I have a great faith in Palo Alto real estate. <laughs> He said, it's only, going, the it's no, only going one way. He said, I, I'm not risking anything. Right, right. He said, you don't know that, but I know that. He said, I'm just being perfectly honest with you. He said, I like the business, and I like you. So, so we did that, and we bought this house. 
and of course they paid me to live in it. <laughs> and that's where we had two children born. And I uh, lived in it for six years, hell at seven before we came here. Anyway, um, uh, do you like uh, Stanford? Do you like living out there? Well, Stanford is uh, uh, Stanford's a wonderful university. Uh, it's a much better one today than the one I found it. It was going through itself a considerable metamorphosis when I came there, especially the business school. And um, it, it's, its reputation wouldn't have been as high as it is today, but, but it was good. It was different from what I had known. And uh, I really just knew the University of Wisconsin because all of the Ohio State stuff was done at Wright-Patterson, not, not on the campus. Now, I had reason to go to the campus at Ohio State and Columbus here and there. But for me, they, it was a great thing because it, it, it got me into the Ford Foundation. You know, the, the, I'm uh, urging a really fine counselor, himself an academic, and, uh, and through my mentor who took kind of a liking to me, who said, you've got precisely the right background. Because you're an engineer, you have mathematics, you have so. So I went out there and did the PhD, but uh, uh, my dissertation came around to an amalgam of what I had learned from uh, in engineering about research and development and commercialization of products, uh, what I had learned in traveling around as a youngster to visit these labs for which we had contracts, and we. Uh, I learned a lot about engineers who were really great at solving problems nobody had. And I thought a lot about that, say, you know, somewhere along the line this has to have applications somewhere that people use. And, and I, I developed a really healthy respect for engineers being problem solvers. One foot grounded solidly in physical sciences and the other grounded very solidly in practical problems that you could solve with it. And I respected that, and I've transferred that thinking to, to the uh, economics and to business that we rest on social sciences, but we're problem solvers and have to worry about application. We're trying to, trying to train professional people. That's a different thing, uh, and of course, Purdue has uh, something of a background in training professional people in not only engineering, but uh, now in vet veterinary science and, and many other things, in pharmacy, surely nursing, and so on. And uh, that's one of the reasons I came and probably stayed here. But uh, I put my attention to my doctoral thesis into that very problem of uh, going from research to commercialization of a product that made sense. And I met a lot of interesting people along the way. Um, this may not mean much to you, but uh, Hewlett Packard, for example, was one of the companies I worked with. And I got to know Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett. Purdue knows him too, right? Right. <laughs> and. Uh, when the company was $180 million in sales, it's, I don't know, upwards to $100 billion today. But that was the 1960s that I'm talking about. And uh, so you could meet those kind of people. It was at the start of, of, the, of the transistor and the integrated circuit. Uh, I met the people who started Intel when they were at Fairchild <laughs> Semiconductor. And, and uh, it was, it was a, time that you didn't right know time. what was going on, but right. historically, you know, from a history perspective, you do. And so I was right involved some of that, right. about how those companies managed themselves or didn't, <laughs> and wrote about that. Anyway. Uh, it was, and there was a cluster of them in that general vicinity. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Right. And as it turned out, my 
oldest daughter, uh, named Suzanne, uh, the two and a half year old that came back from Rome, uh, grew up here in West Lafayette, went through a West Lafayette system, decided to go to Stanford. For her college. For her college. And did. And uh, then decided that she'd go to Harvard for an MBA and did. And then moved back to the Bay Area and became a consultant. The very thing I was, and I can remember the day when she was talking to me and she said, uh, uh, she was at Harvard. I said, well, what are you going to do? She said, I want to do what you did. I said, oh, God, you don't want to become an academic. She said, no, I don't. <laughs> she said uh, uh, she wanted to become a consultant. I did a lot of consulting in my day. And, sure. and uh, so, uh, so she did that. And then she went to work. Did she I, work for Isaac Anderson or not? No, she, she went to work for a very small firm. Okay. A, a Purdue graduate was involved with his name. I cannot dig up for you, but uh, uh, he, was a, he, was, he was a principal in, a, in this company. And uh, this extended some work she was doing at Harvard with a couple professors. And one day she called me, and I had been I had been coming back from some place. Uh, I think it was in Australia, and I was in San Francisco, and I happened to pick up the paper, and was reading about this company that was started uh, in the, in the computer business with Roberts. His name was Cisco, C I S C O. I said, I'm going to invest in that, and I went, came home and did. And I, I did a little more research. Anyway, she calls me up and she said, uh, Dad, she said, I got this job opportunity. I, I, I want to know what you think of it. And I said, okay, well, all right, talk to me about it. She said, well, this company, she, she'd been doing what we did with Purdue One. She was doing in, uh, that kind of work coming out of Harvard in the 80s, okay? Cecilia, they wanted her to do that and to do it system wide and to lead a project. And they had a company with Cisco. Now my ears perked right up and I said, okay, tell me some more. And she said, uh, what the, and she said, oh, by the way, they have a stock option. And I said, tell me about that. And she did, and it was pretty generous. And I said, and, and she said, what do you think I should do? I said, tomorrow morning. You run, don't walk to that place where you can sign the papers that you're going to work for them. <laughs> I said, it will, you will, it will make you rich. It did, <laughs> to the point she married a, a person, a consultant, a young man who came in there working for her. She married. They now have three grandchildren. He started a software company, and she helped fund it. And. Uh, uh, They've been out, uh, uh, they sold it about eight, nine years ago, and they don't work. <laughs> how nice. So, so how Comfort nice. living. How oh, yeah. <laughs> she lives in Atherton. So that's what my oldest daughter did, and she did very well, and uh, uh, lives quite a different life, <laughs> as I point out to people that she can buy and sell me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but... Uh, that was, a, that was an outcome of, of some of this. So anyway, uh, when, I, when I got my degree, I went to work for Stanford Research Institute. That's separate from the school. Yes, and, and, and uh, at that time it used Stanford's name and it's since divorced itself totally. That's it's right. called SRI now. Right. You may <coughs> know it. And uh, I did a lot of economic uh, management type work there. While I was there, and, and I had looked at a couple of academic jobs, and I didn't really want to do them, and I, 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 I went to work for SRI. And uh, I, uh, Frank Bass, the man I had mentioned, who was here then, he moved from Ohio State, Ohio State, State to here. He was hired by the founding dean of the school, uh, and uh, was even prominent days, but he came here, <clears throat> and uh, Frank called me on several occasions and wanted to know if he, I would come here, and I said, no, I'm not going to do that, Frank. Well, one day he called me, he said, Dan, I'm desperate. 
I said, why? He said, well, I, I want to go to England for a year, and the deans won't let me go unless I find a replacement. And, and, I, and it, as it turned out, Mary Lou, my wife, his mother had had a heart attack in Cromwell. Mild, but, and her grand, both her daughters and all her grandchildren lived in California, one in San Diego, and we got them in San Francisco. And so we talked about it and said, well, maybe it may be worthwhile spending a year being closer to your mom and the family and the grandchildren there. So let's do it. So I came and I was Frank Bass for a year. I lived in his house. I had his office. I did all his courses. I so I just was a visitor. I think I got just one year. I was just going to be there. Well, did that. And then M. Weiler, who was the founding dean of the, uh, you may know the name, uh, founding dean, uh, certainly the best of the deans I've ever served on. A uh, remarkably uh, foresighted man uh, knew what he was doing, knew why he wanted to do it. Had the support of Mr. Craner and Dr. Hubdy and, uh, and uh, yeah, the plan. He knew what he was doing. He knew why he wanted to do it, and uh, made sense. And he felt comfortable with what yeah. he needed to do. That's he correct. To do. That's correct. <clears throat> and uh, and he didn't he didn't compromise. Uh, I, I don't mean he's stubborn. He just knew what was needed. It's stubborn and compromise are different. That's right. And uh, <clears throat> and I remember him telling I I sort of became a fair haired boy with him I guess somehow and he, I I became a he recommended me do some consulting work for. Inland Container when they had when they owned the building TV 18 is in now. Oh yeah. Oh, CTS was there. No. Was no, Inland Container. CTS was up the oh, road. Oh, it's further down the yeah. road. That's right. Yeah. And they had a research facility there, and of course I'd had a background in that work, and he wanted me to go take uh, a look at it. And I did, and I that started a 10-year relationship with Inland Container. And Mr. Craner was by that time suffering from, you'd say senility in those days, today you would say something, some forms of dementia. Right. And, uh, but he was on the Inland Board, was M1, so, and so I got involved with him, and then during that year, he was trying to put together one of his visions. He was trying to take a commitment he had gotten from Mr. Craner and the prospect of Mr. Stewart's home, which is now Westwood, he was trying to put that together and build a small hotel out there in which we could run an executive program. In that general area? Yeah. It would be on that property. There's oh, well, 40 acres there, way ahead of his time. And he said, Dan, I'd like you to run it. He said, no, I'm going to be the head of it, but you run. Would you be interested? We had a nice plan, still have the plans. They died a morning because uh, two things. One, I think Mr. Stewart had a little falling out with the university for a time, and he was going to give the house to, I don't know, uh, some, some tri-state. Somebody else. Yeah, and, and Mr. Craner, uh, he, he uh, Weiler had gotten burned because the endowment to the school was made up of market square bonds, and he really wanted he really wanted money, something he could sell, like stock. It's all that fell together. But I stayed on with that prospect in mind. I was going to do that, and uh, and then it fell apart, and, and so I was left there teaching marketing. But I had also, because I was, you know, the, the, the academics uh, treat visitors somewhat like you know, that old saying about treated like a redheaded stepchild. <laughs> That's about what they did to me. I taught that subject, but I taught another one. It was called business policy. 
it was supposed to be a capstone course that put everything together for the student from the top of the organization. And I had had some a lot of interest in that subject. Uh, I won't go into the detail, but it, I did, and, and uh, so I was. I, I did teach it. I taught everything. It seemed like that first couple of years, and I got very interested in it. So you and must have stayed on then after. Yeah, I did. Year. I did. I stayed okay. on with Frank. They, they made an offer with Frank. Frank. Yeah, okay. it had a well. It was probably the best marketing department in the world. It was here at that sure. time, and I was part of it. So I stayed on, and I was tenured in. in I was promoted associate professor in marketing. And then I, uh, and that was circa 1969, 70. Well, in the, in the late 60s, one of the things I, uh, I had several other people here, uh, we frequently ate lunch in the union. And the discussions would wander all over the place. But one of them got around to, and this was the heyday of Martin Luther King and the civil unrest and unrest with students here. Anyway, we decided as a faculty that, several of us did, that why, why in a state where 3% of the population was, was black, we didn't have anything like that. And so we got to thinking about that. Other schools were too. And we decided that we would start a program for disadvantaged students. We labeled it the Business Opportunity Program, BOP. And uh, it still exists. And you may have heard some things about it through a man called Cornell Bell. Mm -hmm. But I was involved, I was one of six faculty members who put up money that we hoped we'd get back. We did the money we could raise to start the program. And we did. And it, we brought 10 actually 11 students, so 10 was our 11th. The 11th person is an interesting story I won't go into. First year, came here in the summer for a remedial program to get them set. So that they, so. Well, that program exists to this day. But in 1970, I, I just been promoted, so I said, and I wanted to switch out of marketing into business policy, and in fact, uh, what I'm known for is strategic management, and uh, I'll get back to that, but I, the thing I'm probably proudest of that I've done here has been my participation in that program. You know, we, we and to were, see it. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I ran it for a year, and, and during that year, I, I, I was up at, uh, in, the, in the region, recruiting and talking to the people, administrators there, and I ran across a man by the name of Cornell Bell. And he was a counselor, and we got to talking. He was at he Gary. He was in a high school, wasn't he? Yeah, there? Gary Andrian. Right. And um, I said, uh, we talked a lot of, I came back, and John Day was then the dean. Mm -hmm. uh, Weiler had, a, had uh, stepped down, he he'd contracted cancer. And In any event, we, I said to John, I said, I got the perfect guy to run this program. You know, Chuck Lawrence, a professor, had been running it. I've run it. I said, uh, Joe Alman, who's left, both Chuck is dead now, and Joe has it's long since been down in North Carolina, or South Carolina. And I said, uh, you know, this is not something academics should be doing, although I'm happy to do it, but I said, this guy's perfect for the job. Perfect. And John went and recruited him and got him to come. And Cornell took the program then and it was soared. And this is in the 60s now, in the 70s. And, you know, big deals are made of diversity today, but Craner School was in this in the 1960s. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very proud to have taken part in that right. program. And they had a uh, an anniversary uh, dinner uh, in honor of Cornell, who had just died last spring, and I 
pleased to attend it and see all the people there, and some of whom uh, knew me. Most of them do, don't now because I've not had any direct role in. But it was it was it was very very important. And this occurred at about the same time that we had a new president at Art Hansen. And I just went to Art's mm -hmm. service on Monday. But he was he's probably my favorite president, the one I, I worked on at everyone from Hubdi up to the current right, one. Right. Very and, time span you would have, right? Yeah. And uh, but he's my he was my favorite. But at the time I had been on the uh, uh, University Senate. Along in that in that frame, I, I don't get the exact chronology anymore. But uh, he invited me to work with uh, <laughs> a rather well-known professor in uh, Schumann, Professor Schumann, who's in, of all things, metallurgy, <laughs> famous guy. <laughs> and he and I worked on uh, financial aid for black students in a, in a program and made recommendations about it. Uh, and. Uh, and then uh, I became a, uh, a uh, chairman of the Student Affairs Committee of the Senate, and Art called on me again to work on uh, Title IX, Women's Intercollegiate Athletics. He asked me to chair the committee, I did, and we made recommendations, which of course were kind of resisted by the and particularly because of the financial parts of it. Sure. But uh, that came to pass, did that under Art's regime, and, and uh, I was very proud to have done something there. So while I'm, nobody ever would ask me any questions whatsoever about diversity, uh, I've worked on it before there was diversity here, <laughs> and right. uh, trying to do something about it, and it was successful. That uh, the business opportunity, is it funded uh, uh, did you get outside funding to get it started? Just this is a point for researchers, the, the BOP or yes. the school health. Yeah, we, I was thinking of researchers might say, since it's a well-known program at the university here, uh, they might want to know, was it, did you get some funding to get it started? Well, what we did was, uh, with the help of R.B. Stewart, okay. uh, we went up and visited several companies up in the region and said, look, we don't need a lot, but we need some. Sure, okay. And what we are in particular doing is, trying to fund that summer remedial. Right, that's what you needed for. That's what we needed for, sure. and, and uh, we each put up a, a modest amount of money uh, to fund it, on the hope we'd get it back. We did, oh, yeah. uh, but we also went up and raised it. Right. Exactly. And from then on, it became easier. Once it started, people saw it, they, it became easier to get the money for right. it. Right, exactly. And, uh, but the first and he was a good... He was running it in charge of it, and he was very, um, very astute. Yeah, no, he, he could go get the money and, and, and uh, well spoken. Yeah, and, and yeah, and once once we got it started, right. that's the thing you learn about in life. Uh, uh, I've learned is that uh, uh, a good idea ends up having a thousand fathers and a bad idea as an orphan. And so if you have success and you take the risks, and I'm a student of it from my days of my father, of, of entrepreneurs taking risks, that's where the critical time in the life of an organization is. Because you're often alone, you're often the only believer, and you've got to convince people to come aboard. And uh, it's, it's talk about some other aspects of my career where that was true, but that that was a, 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 as I say, a very, that period when I was still an associate professor, uh, tenured, yes, but not, a, not the full rank, uh, I was very pleased with what I was doing because was it publishing one more paper? No. But was it, was it a contribution? Absolutely. And and I'm proud to have been a part of it. And uh, I had occasion to talk with Art Hanson last fall. He was here, and Cal Schrock is a neighbor of mine. You may know Cal. And uh, he was visiting with Cal with his new wife. And we had 
and chat for about an hour about reminiscing about old times. He and I are both fishermen too, so we had to talk about a fishing. So he was easily my my favorite, <laughs> uh, and the one I probably knew best. I came to know Steve Beering later uh, after he retired, just like I came to know Fred Hovde after he retired. I played golf with him then, but uh, but uh, Art was a favorite. Well, coming back to my academic stream, then I, I began in, uh, in the early 70s. I had uh, proposed to the, my colleagues, we were under, altering our doctoral program, and I argued for one that was a major in strategic manager. Now, that was a very little used, well, it wasn't used at all as a term, it was my term. But I suggested we call it that, and the faculty agreed. And we started this with a student in 1971. Strategic management. Beg your pardon? management? Yes. Okay. And I felt that it was, uh, it was a course that was called business policy, uh, said to be without content because it was integrating marketing and all the other things, but I felt it had content of its own and argued for that. And. Uh, started looking for a professional society I could, where I could intermingle with people. And I got involved in something called the Academy of Management and started a professional division devoted to this. But it never had the freedom it needed. It's very large today, that division's had maybe 5,500 members. It had, uh, I was its first elected president or chairman, I guess that's what it's called. We had 259 people, it's now 5,500. Of course, it's quite a few years. But it never could do what I wanted it to do. And I, I uh, so uh, later in that decade, I started something called the Strategic Management Society. And that's now about 2,500 members. It's gonna have its 30th meeting in Rome, and uh, 30th annual meeting in uh, September. And I was its founding president executive director for many years, and uh, it was housed here for many years. It's now located in Chicago as a full-time staff, and, and uh, where I, I remember begging for money and uh, riding around the back of Freddie Laker's airplanes and uh, taking terrible risks, and we probably managed uh, between it and the foundation that we spun off last year that I'm the chairman of, uh, managed maybe four, four and a half million dollars today. So uh, my, I thought my father would be proud of me, even though it's not my money. <laughs> he would, yeah. Anyway. Uh, you were a good steward. Well, I was a good steward. Anyway, we started that in the late 70s, and I, uh, did, I was at the peak of writing books and things at that time. And, and, uh, and then I, uh, one of the stalwarts of the field had recommended to a publisher in England who was looking for somebody who could start a journal in the field, recommended me. And he came to see me in uh, 1978, May of the year, and uh, wanted to know what I thought. And I said, well, I'm, I'm a great believer in the field and uh, what you're trying to build. So it does need a journal, but I don't know how successful it's going to be. He said, I, I, yeah, there could be some risks. So I said, I'd edit it. And we did. And I, my wife became a, I was writing some books and she had become my secretary and she got involved with this. And, and uh, so we were running this stuff out of our home. And, uh, say the rest is history uh, but we uh, the, the journal is a class A journal it's a premier journal in its field if not in management I'm very proud of it uh, even though I'm not involved in its operation anymore nor but is you my saw it started well we did, took all the risks sure. I, well, for example right. I remember going to John Day and said I have this opportunity he said that's fine I said don't do it he said but don't expect any support from me I remember paying postage even for it and, and uh, so on. And uh, uh, subsequent deans were quite happy to 
to see it was part of them. They never did support it. And uh, anyway, uh, it was just something we did. And, uh, and you did it well. And it's well, yeah, well, obviously because it's successful. Sure, exactly. And I've sub and I'm now an editor of a second journal we started at the society called the Strategic Entrepreneurship Journal, Entrepreneurship. And I'm going to step down from that to the end of this year. And uh, but I'm I, <laughs> uh, the royalty that the SMJ is generating. I as part of my retirement with uh, John Wiley and Son as a publisher, uh, I negotiated a contract on behalf of the society that the money that annually was thrown off would be used to support further research through an organization called the Strategy Research Foundation, which is now separately organized. Both the society and the foundation are, are Indiana corporations. Uh, not for profit, and uh, we we've got a fair amount of money flowing into the foundation. Okay. So it's just beginning. So I'm I'm very proud of that. And one of your questions is, what am I going to do? Well, what I'm doing is trying to get myself out of the <laughs> society and out of the foundation, so I can retire. But that's what I am doing now. I'm spending a lot of my time on that, and. Uh, but uh, uh, but say from that period of 1980 to uh, about 2000, I was very intimately involved in, in uh, I, my writing work went to practically to zero and my mm -hmm. infrastructure building went up. And of course I taught at that time. Now I was going to retire uh, in uh, 19, which was my 65th year. And uh, I had been involved in the, in, from about 97 onward with a, a uh, alumnus of our MSIA program, a German by the name of Jörg Jürgen Grossman, who has an honorary doctorate from Purdue, uh, had gotten me involved in monitoring some programs of research that benefited his company but benefited the students and he we traveled to Europe and, and, and we, oh, I'm over there when I, uh, and it was in 1998 I guess somewhere in there 97 and I was with this team in Berlin and I was in Berlin because we were going to have a Berlin conference in 1999 part of the society called me up and said, could I get myself to his plant the next day? And I, he wanted me to listen to some people who had an idea for a business school. They said, oh gosh, you're going to Berlin to, to this little town that you're in. I said, come on. He said, well, why don't you get on a, pl a train and come on over to Hamburg? And he says, and yeah, that's where I am right now. And my driver and I will go down there tomorrow morning. So I did. It was at Christmas time. I crashed some Christmas party they were having. Which, anyway, everybody else was at the party. Well, in well into the celebration when I got there, so I was a drag. But anyway, we I did that, and, and I listened to some people who had an idea for business school. I listened in their boardroom and. I said, all right, you've heard our ideas, what do you think? I said, it won't work. Well, they didn't get angry, they just wanted to know why, and I told them. Then they said, what would you do? And I said, here's what I would do if it were me. I said, I mean, this stuff's all off the top of my head. I said, I didn't know what you guys were going to talk about. And uh, so they, they queried me, and they were good people. I left that meeting and went to back at Jürgen was not in the meeting and he said well what happened and I told him <laughs> he laughed I laughed I said well I said probably last I've heard of those guys <laughs> he said we'll see anyway in the following March he called me up and he said could I come over uh, and meet with these people again and I said oh okay why 
He said, I think they got some better ideas. And he said, uh, they'd like to have you listen to them. So I went over there between, I actually flew on a Monday and was back Tuesday night. That's how quick I went. I, I met with him for two, three hours, that's all. Came on back home to his teaching. Took that big trip. Anyway, they did have a better idea. What we had agreed to was I was going to lead them into uh, going to Michigan, Purdue, and a few other places that would become contractors for the school. So I started preparing that, and then I had to go over there and talk to them about it. And when I was over there, the one guy who had most of the money said, look, I want to start this in 1999, it's in 1998. And I said, oh, come on, you, you can't go through all this in that period of time. He says, what if we only went to Purdue? I said, well, two things would happen. One is I couldn't be your consultant. And I said, the second thing is uh, it's a very, very short time fuse. But I said, if you're going to do this, don't, don't start it without having about 25 to $50 million available to you. That's not a problem. Well, money is always a problem. But anyway, we, uh, make a long story short, we did it. We signed a contract with Purdue. And Steve Beering, of course, was very interested in Germany, so it got facilitated, let's put it that way. And uh, uh, so we began in 1999. I was the dean. Okay. Big dean. We're going to stop here for a second. So